On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dial, Rinpoche, Sanjoy Roy, and my colleagues at Teamwork Arts and JLF Toronto, I welcome you to our third session of the day: Food, Memory, and Culture. Meeru Dalwal, Joshna Maharaj, and Asma Khan in conversation with Sanjoy Roy. Food has associations that take it well beyond a means of sustenance. Food triggers emotions, memories, culture, and identity, which is not an exhaustive list. added to that is the creativity of the production of food as it travels across continents while still holding identifiable allegiance to its origins and provenance listen in to three master chefs as they share their interpretations of food ingredients and recipes a keen chef and author meeru dalwal is the co-owner of vids restaurant her books include vids indian a story spices and cherished recipes Vids elegant and inspired Indian cuisine and Vids at home relax honey the warmth and ease of Indian cooking celebrated Indian born british chef and restaurateur Asma Khan of Netflix chef stable is the owner of Darjeeling Express in London she is the author of Asma's Indian kitchen chef and activist Joshna Maharaj's debut book is take back the tree She hosts Kitchen Help Desk, a weekly food column on CBC Radio, and co-hosts a food podcast called Hot Plate. In conversation with Sanjoy Roy, three outstanding master chefs come together in this session to exchange ideas and perhaps recipes. Meeru Dalwal was born in India, raised in the U.S., and lives in Vancouver. She is the co-owner of Vids Restaurant and has written three cookbooks. Joshna Maharaj is a chef, a two-time TEDx speaker, an activist who wants to help everyone have a better relationship with their food. She believes strongly in the power of chefs and social gastronomy to bring values of hospitality, sustainability, and social justice to the table. Joshna has just released her first book, Take Back the Tray, about her work building new models for institutional food procurement, production, and service. Joshna teaches post secondary students host kitchen help desk a weekly food column on CBC radio and she co-hosts a food podcast called Hot Plates Asma Khan opened her London restaurant Dajmi Express in 2017 after running sub clubs and a pop up a year later she published Asma's Indian Kitchen winner of the Gourmand World Cookbook award in the Indian cuisine category in the UK She is the first British chef to feature in Netflix Chef's Table. Sanjoy Roy, an entrepreneur of the arts, is the managing director of Teamwork Arts, which produces over 33 highly acclaimed performing arts, visual arts and literary festivals across 40 cities across the world. He is the founder trustee of Salam Balak Trust, providing support services for street and working children in Delhi. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A. please feel free to send in your questions to us by typing them in the ask a question box on your screens all our sessions will be available to view on our facebook page and youtube channel do follow our pages jlf lit fest across twitter instagram and facebook to get notified on all our upcoming sessions you can also visit our website jlflitfest.org/toronto for the full schedule and information on all our speakers ladies and gentlemen we now present food memory and culture so enjoy over to you 
Thanks so much, Kritika. And it's such a privilege to have uh, Asma all the way from London sitting in her two newly to open restaurant, Darjeeling Express. Miru sitting all the way in Vancouver and Joshna sitting in, in Toronto. You know, what obviously comes to mind, and we better get this out of the way right in the beginning, three women chefs, three people of color, both need celebration, both need uh, all of us to toast you all. I'm gonna just quickly go to Miru and say, Miru, immigrant all the way out to Vancouver, a place known more for his Japanese and Korean uh, food, you guys set up, and I've eaten at Vidya's often and during the Indian summer festivals in the first few years when I visited. I've had the uh, pleasure of not just dining with you all, but having you all serve all our guests. Your first book, of course, was a book about you being a migrant. The second, uh, a, a much more interesting uh, and a different uh, point of view, uh, 10 or 15 years into marriage, two kids, and having settled and set up bridges. The third book, which I think is a much more difficult book, is about pain, it's about family, it's about relationship. But going back to those initial days when you struggled uh, to set up shop in Vancouver, as a person of color, as a woman, what was it like? So I moved to Vancouver when I was 30 years old from Washington, DC. And um, the first thing that struck me was how differently Indians were treated in Canada versus in the US. Um, in the US, we were, quote unquote, not to be cynical, but we were the good minority to hire, right? Oh, hire an Indian, they're smart, their parents make them work hard. Um, we had a different stereotype. I moved to Canada and suddenly people were talking to me like this, as if uh, uh, I couldn't speak English or something. and. Um, I was new, it was Canada, and uh, I don't have any professional experience whatsoever in cooking. My background was in human rights, it was in economic development projects, so I never really took it upon myself that um, I was actually doing something serious the, those first six months. But uh, you fall into it, you fall in love, um, you know, it sounds like a cliche that you fall in love with cooking. Um, I think I fell in love with the whole world. Of, of food. And for me, food is, um, I cook and then I run businesses and um, I'm a big extrovert. And so for me, my cooking suddenly turned into not my profession, but um, my pedestal with which I could communicate to the world. Mm -hmm. So um, whatever I read, if I read an article on Rwanda and this is what's happening in Rwanda, well, I would come up with a dish so I could use that dish as an excuse to talk about what I read in Rwanda. Um, my cooking, my food, it wasn't necessarily as a business as much as, oh my goodness, I can talk to the world now. So, um, and that's how I spoke to Canadians as well, right? That, hey, you know what? Don't talk to us like that. Don't, don't talk to us as if there's some underlying dumbness because, you know, we aren't of a certain color or anything like that. And there was no ill will, but it was just there. Uh, Asma, pretty much like what Vijay's where they have uh, women coming in every day to create their food and make their food. You really have been steeped in the culture of Calcutta, but you've traveled all the way from Lucknow and Aligarh across the subcontinent, bringing together, merging different sort of recipes. And all of that, you transported to cold and dreary Oxford. I mean, you know, what were you thinking? What were you going to eat there? And you weren't even somebody who knew how the kitchen worked when you were in India, you were just spoiled. Yeah, so the thing is that, you know, I married an, 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 you know, an academic and, and it, was, it was Cambridge, not Oxford, but same, same dairy place, uh, another Oxbridge, uh, they're both equally dreary. It Except was a real shock. Has one, also, one or two better restaurants than Oxford. So maybe we should <laughs> give it that. Maybe, but it was very hard. It was very hard to, understand I had an arranged marriage so you know I was with a stranger and he was very very different from me so you know culturally completely different and you know I had never in my life you know been alone in a room I think ever uh, growing up in a very big family never eaten a single meal alone 
I never slept in the room alone with my, you know, there was always somebody sleeping, you know, in the room with me, you know, sometimes random relatives as well. But it was this feeling that, you know, you were never alone. And I found it, I found the loneliness overwhelming. I, I moved in January. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to understand this now because the way technology is, you've forgotten what it's like. But, you know, 30 years ago, my parents didn't have a stable phone line. Uh, there was no mobile phone. There was no internet. Uh, there was nothing. There was no way of communicating. I wrote letters to my father. You know, I'd seen, you know, the Ryan O'Neill love story, you know, where the trees without leaves. But the reality of walking up to a tree, stripped naked of everything, the bark so dry, I felt that way. I felt stripped naked of everything beautiful and warm. And I remember holding a tree and weeping in my Kolapuris that was soaked through with the damp of Cambridge. I thought the tree would never have a spring and I would never have a spring. It was very hard and I didn't want to piss off my brand new husband by telling him how miserable I was and how awful Cambridge was, how cold I was. And my mother had, you know, collected my trousseau over many, many years. And she gave that trousseau to me and no warm clothes. Yes. So I went out and all my matching, you know, my, you know, my kussas were matching embroidery to my silk shalwar kameez. So it wasn't even just the fact that I was in an alien place. I was so uprooted, I couldn't breathe. And this is why I had to cook. Joshna, I remember, um, you know, I'd gone in for an operation in a very fancy hospital. I was in my suite. It was a, I had to get my gallstones out, um, you know, came out of uh, anesthesia, uh, opened my eyes, wanted something to eat and, you know, somebody arrived with a very fancy tray with just the worst kind of food ever, mm. unpalatable. You talk yeah. about this pretty much early in your book in terms of when you came out of anesthesia and you were given uh, a sandwich with the edges not even completely buttered. And that's really awful. I mean, anybody who does that should be sacked straight off. And I, then that is my policy in the kitchen. I will fire anybody who makes dry corners. A hundred percent. No tolerance for dry corners. So tell, tell us about how you've been able to work the whole institutional er and including with prisons. I mean, that's what I found really fascinating, given that, you know, of 58 cents or, or 50, I think 58 cents is what you said, was the budget on, on the food. And the way you sort of look at food and you look at the experience, irrespective of your situation, be it in hospital or be a prison. Right. This is, thanks, thanks for this. Um, I just realized as I'm about to answer, this is the first time I'm gonna answer this way. And that is my love of cooking emerged uh, while I was living in India for a year after I, I left university, right? I mean, look, I always say that I'm the oldest female child in an Indian family. So there's no way I was escaping the kitchen ever, right? That was a given. But uh, I went to India after university and I was living in an ashram in the foothills of the mountains and like going for walks and eating mangoes and stuff. And I made a deal with my parents that they would let me do this for a year and then I'd come home with a plan for the rest of my life, which are the only the promises you make when you're 24 years old, right? But in the ashram, the aunties there were very concerned about what I was doing and who my insane parents were, right? All that just let me run to the other side of the world. Anyhow, they wrote me into the kitchen. They put me to work. I literally was kneading chapati dough on my haunches that night, uh, right? And I was doing their work. But like in the, in the spirit of that, in that, you know, very basic ashram kitchen, bare, barefoot on the floor, chopping in my lap, I completely fell in love with all of it, right? I was like the smells, the, and, and the most important thing for me was to watch the way that people ate the food after we served it, right? It was, uh, there's dal and rice that we made. It was nothing fancy at all, but it was with fresh, beautiful, local, organic produce. Uh, and I would started to notice that when the head cook was cranky and not in a good mood, then we all sort of were cranky and not in a good mood. And, and that we would start serving that food to all the brahmacharis and the swamis and all the people who were in that. And we'd see the indigestion kind of wave, you know, wash over the dining room. And then I'd see the other side of it, where the cook would have like a little rosy cheeks and he would be, you know, cause he just saw his girlfriend or some cute little thing like that. And then we'd be singing in the kitchen and everything would be so very jolly and jovial. And I would watch that ladle by ladle go out to everybody, right? And I really understood 
the uh, both the incredible responsibility and the, the importance of the role of a cook, right? But I was like, this is like, you can have exponential impact on people with one, and we all know, right? A big pot of curry is the loveliest way to feed a crowd of people. So I'm, I'm walking you through this because this is the, these are the roots of how, how I became a chef, right? I was like, I want, I could do this for a living, right? I, I discovered that, I, that I, this is a viable thing. I sent a proclamation home to my parents that this was my plan and went to collect, you know, they, I mean, they weren't that excited. There was a lot of negotiation, but we figured it out. And so, but then fast forward to me in cooking school, realizing that there was no space anywhere for any of this feel-good nonsense that I was bringing, right? Uh, and never mind the fact that it was like, it was like 35 men and two women in my section, let alone being a brown woman coming in and I'm gonna start talking about blessings and this, no, right? Not at all. The point of this all is, is that once I, the institutional piece came, right? I was most offended by that food uh, uh, with, a, with the perspective of hospitality, right? From a hospitality perspective, those trays of food are a disaster, right? And the, because I firmly believe that any plate of food served anywhere is a reflection of the attitude that produced that food, right? However it is, right? If it's some beautiful elaborate thing that you toiled over, or if it's a bagel and a coffee that comes through a drive through window, right? The values and attitudes are being delivered with the food. And so when I looked at those hospital trays, you read to me, the, the only value there, like the only message that's going to patients is you are not worth any more effort than this, right? And from a hospitality perspective, that's like, it's like flashing red lights of a disaster, right? It's exactly not what you want. And um, my roots are in community food security and social justice around food and food system stuff. And so I, it did not make sense to me why this food was so terrible, right? I never, like, it was, is it just money? And the answer is no, it's not just money. The problem is not just what we're spending and the recipes we're using. To me, the problem is the attitude that thinks that that plate of food is an okay thing to serve, right? And that's, and so the work that I've been trying to do to rebuild this, to really rethink how we sort of engage with food uh, in, the, in the context of health and wellness education and rehabilitation. I mean, the big secret that I'm gonna reveal is that I've been working to open up space for this beautiful, uh, these, this, you know what I mean? For that stuff from the ashram to have a place to live, right? It's, I can't talk about love and blessings and connection because people get a little crazy. So instead the words that really speak to people are like uh, accountability and transparency and you know what I mean? And, and value and all this kind of nonsense, but really, I have just been trying to find space so that we have clear, open, uh, uh, like, portals, right, to be able to deliver the best things that our land produces, the best things that our hands can make out to people who, you know what I mean, are, are healing, learning, or, you know what I mean, working on improving themselves. And obviously, it's a mega uphill battle, but, it, uh, but the work in just a few years, the things that I have been able to uh, you know, overturn and uncover and the systems that I've been able to kind of untangle really speak to the truth that says that uh, the, like, the only reason this food is so bad is because nobody with any real power cares enough about food to do anything differently, right? And for me, considering the indignity and the disrespect that's happening to people on the planet as a result, that is not a good enough reason. So there, so that's that's really why I jumped in to try and make this change. Mary just not talked about uh, love and blessings. Pretty much what you've spoken about in your first couple of books about love and food. Your third mm -hmm. book was really about food and pain, which is not something that you know one explores. Tell us a little bit about that and and how that affected the kind of food and the kind of recipes that came out of that experience because it has progressed uh, enormously. So one thing um, I have a problem with with my industry is um, I don't know if it's um, the people who want us to be this way or we want to be this way. We a lot of times make it seem like we're very, um, you know, everything is great. We cook wonderful meals. We've got, I mean, there's something glamorous suddenly about what we do. And like I said, uh, for me, it's about communicating. Um, a little, I want to pick up a bit on what Joshna was saying. Um, 
nothing to me is more important than figuring out a way as idealistic as this sounds and bringing people together in the sense I'm from the US, look what's happening there right now. Um, all of these differences. I'm not one who now I've changed. I don't celebrate differences anymore, right? I've switched over like, you know what? I am no different than you. We are no different from each other. This whole idea of celebrating differences has failed me. And so um, the last cookbook, you know, around the same time, um, Vikram and I, I moved to Vancouver a bit like Asma. I was, I got married. So, and it was partially arranged, but it was all, we called it the arranged love marriage. Um, I moved here very passionately in love. I got into the business. We were very passionately in love. The reason why the business did so well is what better combination recipe do you want, right? Than the man and, or, you know, husband and wife, and he's running the front, I'm doing the kitchen, and it's just love all over the place. That was the first book. The second book, we've done so well, we're complimenting each other, we've got the kids, but you know what, we're getting a little tired. Then in the third book, everything kind of fell apart. 17 years of marriage, divorce, okay? Mom had massive, my mother uh, had a massive stroke, and suddenly she couldn't hear anymore, she couldn't talk anymore, she couldn't walk anymore, but I'm at a distance, and so everything that I was relying on had fallen apart, and I thought, you know, I'm not going to fake happiness in this cookbook. A lot of people have to struggle with what do I do with my aging parents? Um, for me, it was what do I do with my aging parents who brought their history of India and the refugee camps with them? And, you know, dad was very violent. And dad always used the excuse of the refugee camp and the partition as, you know, what I saw in India, what I went through. I lost my brother. I lost my mother. I lost my father. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, I had all these issues with my mom and dad, but of course you love your mom and dad. So there's this love, there's a guilt, there's a struggle of, is it my life? How much of my life do I give up for my mom and dad's life? Then all of a sudden, but wait a minute, I was very deep, we were very deeply in love and we're splitting up, but we're trying to run a business together, trying to be a normal family for the kids. And I thought, why wouldn't the world want to know this? There's a, enough cookbooks out there with Indian recipes, right? And every Indian recipe is great if it's written properly and if it comes from the right place. But for me, it was more of saying, all right, here are the recipes. Here's what we ate the night we told our daughters we were going to break up, right? And here's how my daughters ate that food when mom and dad were saying, hey, girls, um, all is great, but, um, you know, Papa and I are, were breaking up. And so, um, for again, it goes back to what I said in the beginning, um, uh, how do I make my world involved more? I don't want to sound like a better place or anything like that, but you know what? We are all the same. And that's what my books are trying to say is we are all the same, really. Asma, I remember in Meru's book, there's this wonderful cauliflower recipe that her mother uh, uh, tries to make and she's, she, she went back and created that. Asma, in your... In, in your restaurant too, you know, it was my last meal in London, just pre-lockdown. I think it was the 3rd or the 4th of March. We sat around, there were a million people. And I remember the one occasion that I was on the underground, I said to Lindy, our colleague in London, I said, Lindy, what if COVID gets to London? Can you imagine what's gonna happen? And of course it happened. But in your restaurant, what really struck me in all of the midst of all of that all, all, all of that energy was the fact that your kitchen was completely staffed uh, by women. And you led that, that kitchen as a woman. Tell us about that, because in London, breaking that barrier as a chef and finding fame and fortune with Darjeeling Express, it would have been a challenge. And tell us a little bit about the women. The women are really the Express, in Darjeeling Express, they are the ones who have pulled me along. I stand on their shoulders. Because when this whole thing started, you know, I started from home, you know, I, I did it behind my husband's back, I was doing supper clubs. So these were the nannies and cleaners, you know, who used to work in the hospital, who came in to help me. And, you know, they've been here throughout this whole journey. They're also here in this amazing space downstairs where the kitchen is, it's like a palace. For the first three, four days, we were all getting lost. Uh, it's huge for us. This kind of journey has been incredible. But I think that, you know, I couldn't have opened this restaurant in Calcutta. 
for one reason. I think, you know, when you just look back and think that there are very few women who are cooking in a professional capacity in India who are not in Oberoi's and Taj, you know, or not in a high-end restaurant. In a kind of ordinary restaurant, which I was when I started, we were just a group of women who got together to cook. I look at them and then there's this uncomfortable truth that I know. I'm a, I'm a Muslim from a royal family. My entire staff is Hindu. Half of them are vegetarians. Where would I have met them? Where would I have sat down and had tea with them in Calcutta? Where would this closeness have happened, this relationship? In a foreign land, in Kalapani, where we left home and we knew we could not go back for different reasons. Me, because I was mad at these women because they had to earn the money for their family. We formed, we formed a bond because we lost our meeting and we knew we couldn't go back. Now, this is the thing that, you know, what held us together was this thing that we create home. And I remember the, the day that we got absolutely hammered in Diwali and all my women are like in their 50s and 60s. Lakshmi Puja, they had to go home. And, you know, we just like lost control over the bookings. I thought I had closed it. It hadn't, whole restaurant was full. And Uma told me, she says, Mem sahab, hum to ghar nahi Aap meri devi hai, ye mera mandir hai. That you are my goddess and this is my temple. Now, this is the thing that, you know, this is what London can do for us. It allowed us to bury all our biases, all our regional differences outside the door of the restaurant. And we became something powerful. And the fact that, you know, I, I spent too much money. Now, of course, I regret it because I left that restaurant. Uh, I spent 40,000 pounds of money. I really scraped together for that extractor so I could show people the hands that cooked because for too long we have been behind walls and in a small restaurant I mean you were there it's not smelling of food I had the most powerful extractor and of course bloody everyone thinks they live in the Ritz on Carnaby Street it was pulling it above the highest building a stainless steel tower it cost me a fortune I had to do it because it didn't matter the quality of the chairs that people sat on the other decorations my greatest you know or we say my greatest gana, my real jewels were the women. I didn't need to decorate my restaurant. I just needed people to see them. And this was very important for me because, you know, as the other two have pointed out, for me, food is about politics. It's about power. It's about my right to be counted. If you don't want me on the table, I will pull up a chair and sit down. You notice who I am. And in the London food scene, I am different in every way. I'm, the, I am on the fringes of hospitality. I used to say that, but today, this is like Covent Garden's great real estate building, a heritage building that once, you know, Antonio Cagliocchio was here. You know, this is where he would teach people how to make bread. And it's ironic that, you know, I follow his footsteps, but I, I don't see this as about myself. I see this for every woman who feels excluded from, you know, being in the center of where she wants to be. And I just tell everybody, you know, we rose from the ashes you know, pandemic has destroyed us. But all these women have are come here. They've taken over the space. And we did, ironically, we did Lakshmi Puja and Diwali over here uh, because we, you know, we hadn't opened, but, you know, they, they wanted to do the puja in the, in the uh, kitchen. A whole the bit about the pandemic, I'll come back to that. Yushna, one of the, one of the most beautiful things that I read in, in your book, in one of the chapters, is, it is often said that beggars can't be choosers and that hungry, hungry people should accept any food that is offered to them. I call that bullshit. Hungry people still deserve to have their humanity and dignity preserved while accessing emergency food services. Given the pandemic and given the food, the food, uh, 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 the food kitchens that have been set up across the world, tell us a little bit, you also talk about sustainability and the importance of sustainability, uh, both for the body as well as, uh, you know, for, the, the need to get local stuff there. Tell us a little bit about how the pandemic has shaped that. Yes, it's, uh, it's been pretty incredible. I am connected to a community food center uh, on the ground here in Toronto. And uh, this is a place that is very robust uh, grassroots programming. And the, when the pandemic hit, all the other programs were folded. And the two programs that remained were a dining program and a food bank. Uh, both and the dining program now had to be all takeout, right? Because nobody can come inside and sit. But the once I periodically we take a look at the graphs of the numbers, and there is a very dangerous spike. 
right? Food insecurity, people who like the, the large volume of people who were sort of teetering at the edge have now slid right into food insecurity. And we're including people like students, post-secondary students are a very sort of unaddressed population here too, because many of them literally were kicked out of their residences and meal plans that they had paid for were canceled, but no money had, you know, had been returned. And so food security is a, is a pretty dangerous reality. Um, and so we're seeing it all over the place. The need is steadily growing. Uh, all of my colleagues who work in nonprofit are bracing themselves because while there was a lot of generosity in terms of donations to help and support, there, we don't know how long this money has to last, right? While government subsidies start to dry up and then, you know, the convergence of those two things uh, really becomes a problem. And one of the challenges that I'm really uh, that I'm really focused on is this idea that during intense moments like this pandemic, can we still uphold our values, right? About the kind of food that everybody should be getting. Uh, can we still put out fresh, wholesome, good meals, you know, where farmers got paid fairly and people put thought and care in it? Like, can that all happen as these numbers are spiking and we're putting everything in, in you know, biodegradable clamshells to send out the door? Uh, it, is, uh, it is alarming. We're all sort of bracing ourselves uh, you know, not sure exactly what the what the what the plight is going to be. But one of the cutest and most sweetest things that have happened is that farmer surpluses are a part of our reality now too, because farmers aren't selling to restaurants. Uh, but what we're seeing is because farmers are connecting with nonprofits, uh, some of those folks are eating are actually eating some of the best food ever. Right, they're eating, this is the best, many of them are eating because they're getting access to a lot of this beautiful farm fresh food. Uh, and that is a, a bit of sweetness, I think, that is coming out of a very difficult situation. No, you're absolutely right. Even in India, in Delhi, we do a food program and our whole thing was to get the dry rations, but also to get fresh vegetables. And luckily, Kyasa Farms, who joined hands uh, with us at Salam Balak Trust, provided us the most brilliant vegetables which they actually uh, provide to modern bazaar. Uh, Mira, both Asma and sort of just have talked about it. The ego in the kitchen, the difference between I think the three of you and perhaps many of your male colleagues or, or, or equivalent male colleagues in the in kitchen is completely different. Each of you have talked about love, working together, wanting to celebrate hospitality. Is that the difference? Is, do you feel that that's the difference between, say, a man in the kitchen and the woman in the kitchen in terms of at that particular position? Um, for us personally, I'm talking it's a about a professional kitchen here. Right. Um, so again, like um, Asma's kitchen, so we are also all women in uh, the Vidges and Ring, the Vidges kitchen. And um, uh, there is no ego because we didn't go to cooking school. I don't know um, what else to say. None of us went to cooking school. The one person who went to cooking school was Vikram. And so he was out in the front. And I'm very clear about something. I was very planned about this. Um, Vikram, you're going to do the front because unfortunately reality hits, right? I, I want to do what I enjoy. And let me, so we, what we have it is I'm like this in the kitchen. Vikram is like this out to the rest mm -hmm. of the world. So I'm, you know, I'm going to be honest. I don't know how successful he and I would have been if we did not have each other. Right. So again, I've hired men in the kitchen, you know, I've hired nephews, I've hired students, but um, they like to bang. They, they don't understand that the, the world doesn't really revolve around them. I have a rule. There's no yelling in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. Um, it ruins my, it just ruins things. There's no yelling in the kitchen. Um, I listen to my GM, Amarjeet, in the kitchen. As far as language is concerned, there's no ego because um, I speak Hindi fluently, but I speak with an American accent, right? My mom and dad were Punjabi, so I understand Punjabi way better than I understand Hindi, but parents taught me Hindi. My kitchen staff speaks Punjabi, but village Punjabi, right? Mm -hmm. From, um, you know, from the villages in Punjab. Um, I speak in Hindi, they speak in Punjabi. All the spices are, you know, listed in different languages. Uh, the Seattle restaurant that we had, um, half my staff was Ethiopian, Eritrean. They didn't speak English. And so when language is such a big, um, I wouldn't say it's a barrier. Language brings its own culture as well, its own ways of doing things. There's no room for the ego there. And finally, um, 
I don't want ego in that food. There's nothing more upsetting. If we are going to talk about food insecurity, the class, class of food, um, you know, restaurants charging so much money and all that, um, you know, there can't be ego in food. I'm allergic to that. I'm allergic to that male chef. I'm allergic to that male chef talk. That's why I don't do TV shows really, because I, I, I can't put on that show. I just don't like that show. Um, and so Vikram, did it, I did what I did. And um, I'm a little embarrassed to say, I don't know if our restaurants would have been as successful if it were just me. Asma, uh, may, may we talk about language? Does food have a language? I mean, you know, in Darjeeling uh, kitchen, whether it's the kosha mangshu, or whether it's those wonderful shami kebabs, uh, your language is sort of, it's, uh, it's a it's a mix. It it crosses boundaries. It's not defined. Uh, how do you deal with with the language of food and the language of spices and the aromas? It is very important because there is there is there are stories that these dishes carry with them, and it's important to understand them and respect them. And one of the things that I I've decided to do, which is over here on Sunday, we're doing a brunch of an undivided India. Starting off with Halwa Chana Puri of Karachi, we go down to the, to the Mughlai Paratha of Dhaka. We do, if we do brunch and we celebrate the food. Because as I've always said, I've been said it to you. I cooked the food in the 1930s, you know, when partition destroyed us as Indian Muslims. And it was really, you know, there is a language and this is why I needed to do this because I need to be able to express those stories that were never told of pain, of partition, of division and having this Karachi breakfast with someone, you know, who's always been told, you know, go to Pakistan when I'm Indian. I want to cook that breakfast. I want to sit on the table and share, break bread with people so that we understand how similar we are. And I want to sit with a Mughlai Paratha. My whole family was, was split, torn apart by, by what happened in between Bangladesh and, and, and West Bengal. You know, I live between two. My husband is from Bangladesh. So it's really, it is very important, but it's important that the stories be told. But they, but they have to understand that, you know, I tell this to people, you can't just take my food without me. You cannot separate culture and food. I won't let you do that. I won't let you have my food if you don't listen to my story, because it is part of me, part of my DNA. So yes, absolutely. You know, food, food has stories, just like old Havelis, where the bricks have stories that they want to tell you know, our food as well. And we need to be the storytellers because this is a generation who still have connection with grandparents and mothers who still know these stories. A generation after us will have forgotten these stories and it'll just be a dish. And that is not right. I'm going to have to go to, um, to questions from the audiences because they're pouring in. But before I do that, just one quick last thing, food is stories. You know, and, and you have told this beautiful story about, you know, displacement, about people who should uh, get better than what they're getting in the, in the, from the system itself. Tell us about the power of the story and the power of food, uh, both of them. Yeah, it's, it's giant. I think just like um, both the other two here have said, the power that the story of, food, of, the, of a plate of food has is exponential, right? It, it reaches far. Like I'm, the thing that really comes to my mind right now is just, um, is my idea about reanimating all of the hands involved in moving food from field to kitchen to table, right? That's sort of from a like grassroots sustainability perspective, that's the argument that I make for the work that I do. And that I just, I want all the human beings involved to be more respected and well-paid and acknowledged for their contribution to this dish. But you can see the, the only way that the plate or the dish becomes that beautiful whole being greater than the sum of the parts is when you have those acknowledgements, right? Is when you have a connection to who grew those greens and what went into that, what was happening, which soil it was happening in. I know that these are like dreamy romantic stories, but at the same time, it's also, it's also about humanity. You know, some of the, I constantly find myself these days, especially in this pandemic conversation, I'm constantly reminding other people that before it is anything else, our relationship with food is about staying alive, 
right? That is the point. It's this glorious system of things that come out of the ground that taste amazing so that we keep eating them so that we stay alive. Uh, and, and whatever we cook, however we present food, it needs to be sort of as, as stewards of that beautiful transaction that's happening, right? When something comes from a farm to my kitchen, my responsibility is to just like dress it up a little bit and then send it out to, you know what I mean? To not mess with the beautiful things that farmer has done, put the best things that I have got with all of my history and my connections on that dish and then send it out to people so that it gets that stamp all along the way, right? That to me is how the stories get written. Uh, Shubhadeep asked, do you think- Can I add one thing about really important, which Asma said, which connects to what I really quickly, the partition, the partition of India, the dividing of all of the subcontinent, the Hindus, the Muslims, every, that is the crucial definition of where so much racism and so much violence is happening. But so many Indians don't even know about it besides those of us who are from that um, area. Um, in America, really quickly in the US, when I moved to 1969, Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus, we were all dining together. My mom and dad's friends were all Muslim, Sikhs, and Hindus. Then suddenly, about 1978, 79, the Muslims went their own way because whatever was happening with Zia al Haq in Pakistan and so on. Then the Sikhs went the other way. We were sharing the same food, then suddenly it became Pakistani food, Indian food, right? Punjabi food. So I think politics with us and the rate, I love what you had said, Asma, about the whole. The, the Muslim, it's a crucial thing to talk about in our cuisine, I think. Mm -hmm. It's the politics of food. And I think you've roughly answered this question that Shubhadeep has asked. Do you think this lockdown helped us to take an inner journey through our own cuisines and culture or experiment with it? Did you want to add a comment on that? Meru? No, I, I spoke enough. I think Asma might have a good answer. Asma, I'm going to throw another question at you. This is from Prabhakar Kaza, who says, food is a major link and keeps the memory of our forefathers alive. I have not attended one Indian party, official or social, held in a non-Indian restaurant. Any comments? No, the thing is food, you know, th there is a lot of racism uh, when it comes to even restaurants. W one of the things that I've done is I have a 95 pound tasting menu without alcohol because I'm so tired that people will say it was only French and Spanish and Italian cuisines. You know, in London, a, a 95 pound tasting menu, uh, no one will pay because of the color of my skin, you don't value my food. You think my food is not elevated. We're not sophisticated. And I think the problem is that we have not been able to put present our story well enough and people think they dismiss our food as cheap and cheerful oh my god we're not and the problem is that this is why you know our food is just seen as a, a curry and you know you'll blow your head off you know yeah. you can go and have a bindalu oh my god this sets my heart on fire i hate it so yeah i think that the problem is that we our food is not honored because i think we are not honored well we did it to ourselves that's how at least in the u.s we did it to ourselves right food was was, it was a business, right? Oh, we are going into business. Just put that food out there. So we did, and so we are now trying to undo that. Yeah, exactly. Totally, and I think the politics of food that you all talked about. I mean, the other interesting thing is that, you know, the role of food in being able to help, uh, especially uh, empower women, women who have suffered uh, violence in their own homes. Uh, and that's a whole different story, but maybe we'll hold that for a second. Uh, Rana Khan asks Joshna and Asma, uh, can you remember one outstanding dish prepared by someone else uh, that you've used as inspiration? I'll just be very brief. Uh, I had a Pathan uh, from Waziristan who made me chapli kebab um, in a mm -hmm. restaurant. I'd gone there. Uh, and it's it's called Made in Pakistan, the restaurant. He told me, I'm going to make this chapli kawa for you. You'll never forget it. It's true. I have never forgotten. I've tried really hard. That man was just unbelievable. Crushing my spirit. He told me, oh, you think women can cook? I'll show you a man can cook. And he did. So yeah, that's one thing. I've never been able to replicate. Why haven't you kidnapped him and brought him to Darjeeling Express? Hey, come on. <laughs> He's very loud. He's very loud. He has a big ego. I can't deal with that. If you just give me a chapli kebab, I just take the kebab, not him, because he's a bit too big. Uh, you know, the man talks a lot, more than me. 
Joshna, a, 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 a dish that's inspired you, which you haven't made, that you still remember? Uh, yeah, this is definitely uh, one of my aunties. She has since passed away, but she, um, uh, green chutney, right? She made, she has her way of making green chutney and nobody like since she has passed, like almost 10 years have happened and her kids and me, we all keep trying to be like, how did, how did she make it? Sometimes, cause she would always like a little apple she would sneak in sometimes or she would, you know, boast about whatever funny little twist she put on it. But it's like, it's like, it's some, it's like my whole life. It will evade me. You know what I mean? Every version, I keep trying to make it evoke Auntie Kay and her, you know, her sweetness and her kindness with how she would always, and it's the thing that's perpetually in the fridge, right? Everything is a bit better with a slash, uh, you know, a swash of green chutney on top of it. Uh, and so my, my version, sadly, is only a me version. And I'm constantly making it, trying to channel her to, you know, to pull that flavor and that, that love and kindness into it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. All of us try and strive to make, you know, yeah. key, key uh, recipes of our grandparents, of our mothers, uh, you know, and it's so difficult to recreate. Mira, I'm going to ask you the last question. Uh, you know, there was a session that we did yesterday. It was such a beautiful and touching session that it stayed with me about how this young, I mean, a, a woman who was 10 years in marriage completely uh, uh, you know, in a very difficult situation, everything was controlled, um, great sort of control by the family that she was married into. But she used food in many ways to be able to get out of that. And when she finally left with her kids in, in, in the university uh, that she joined in Toronto, she made her butter chickens and her biryanis, sold that to be able to make money. Just and then give us a sense of women and empowerment and food. Well, it's a very personal sense of empowerment because a lot of women have, we have not have had access to education, uh, power. Let's just talk about where does our power come from traditionally? It's changing with, you know, the generations of my daughter. Um, from my mother, when she arrived in 1969 to the U.S., suddenly she couldn't speak English. Uh, she had no job experience. My mother went through very, very deep loneliness. And um, her first job was cleaning bathrooms at McDonald's, right? Um, to go from being a sitar player and a musician in All India Radio to cleaning bathrooms in fast food restaurants, um, having an abusive husband, um, food is how she just dealt with everything. I remember going to school and I hated it because my hair smelled like cumin and coriander and so on. Um, so food, it was, it was the equivalent of writing in your journal almost. That's how you communicated. Um, then you feed those that you love. Right. And uh, again, it's a very personal form of empowerment. So if you can't control the person abusing you right now or you're not strong enough yet, you're afraid to, you know, control the abuse that's happening to you. You seek your own sense of empowerment in other ways. And for a lot of women um, in the subcontinent, I think that came through. No one touched you when you were cooking. No one approached you when you were cooking, when you were learning to cook. Um, I just wish that that form of cooking was taught to, to the sons as well, and not just the daughters. Because like Asma said, the man from Waziristan who had a wonderful cook, right? But his ego, right? Um, it's really just too bad that people, more people don't see that at a very micro level, all we really want to do actually is we feel so empowered when somebody feels loved by us or when we feel loved by that other person and so for women, especially, it was done through cooking. And I think when you make that exit into that new world from, you know, the abusive home to, you know, university in Toronto, well, what's your sense of power in form of communication? It's going to be that butter chicken. And one more thing about Indian food. Um, you know, Asma was talking about how much she speaks. You can tell I speak a lot as well. We are a very social culture. It doesn't matter what any, we are a social culture and I'm convinced that's why our food is so, it has such a huge smell slash fragrance because that food is inviting you. You're walking down and you're smelling it and you want to say, hey, what is that? So um, we're not a hole in the wall. We're a very, our spices, everything about our food is social. Well, I would have loved to continue this conversation forever and ever, but hey, 
Asbak Khan, Meru Dhalwal, Joshna Maharaj, thank you so enormously from all of us at JLF. Three women, accident of birth, which is the color. Each of you have really broken every possible, shattered, not broken, shattered the glass ceiling, done amazing work, more strength to the three of you. May you continue to feed with love, empower people, and really get those spices to raise up a storm and get people rushing to your restaurants in a long, long line. Kritika, over to you. Thank you, Sanjoy. Thank you, Miru, Asma, and Joshna for sharing your stories and inspiring us and a lot of women across the world. More power to you, like Sanjoy said. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We encourage you to, bu to buy the books of our speakers, which are available through bookstores listed on our website. Once again, we'd like to thank all our partners for their support. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will tune in for our next session, Burning the Books, A History of the Deliberate Destruction of Knowledge. Richard Avandan and Vikri Bowles in conversation with Sharmila Sen. This will be at 2 p.m. EST, 11 a.m. PST and 12.30 a.m. IST. Thank you once again. And now we present a reading by Harjit Dosanj and David Zolia from the Jaipur Writer Short Series. Hello everyone, my name is Hajito Sanj and I'm a creative writing student at the University of Regina. The poem I'm going to read for you today is called Mother Earth. One evening, walking back from the park, I saw some kids light an axe can and tip it into your jaws. My fingers scrambled to take off my jacket, to pat the growing flame away. The kids hissed, I trembled, hands into you, cried all over you, held your pebble teeth into my palms. On the walk home, you cry all over me and spit into my hair. I'm from Toronto. I'm currently studying social sciences at the University of Toronto, and the following poem is titled Aching Timbers. I have so much, I know, but not to have to turn my back on what those I love endure is what I envy those who live their lives at home. It's beyond my grasp, I know, for all my will can't fully really tear away my home. So why tear? Why run? Well, to ignore the pain of crumbling foundations, to accept the quicksand of decaying joints and aching timbers. Time has cut a gash I dare not try to hold for those I love. Mere attempts cause floods so hard to hold. So as months and years see my home drift to ruin, I stand outside and I turn my back. One hopes new beginnings stand ahead, just past memories of deep blue snow. So leave I will. And that which I hold are lessons from the old, foundations tempered by knowledge of what won't hold. <laughs>
Arts, bringing India to the world, the world to India, to Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Teamwork Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavour of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars, be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalaotsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, Festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzy. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the multi-city Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information visit www.teamworkarts.com Hello everyone and welcome to Kahani Online where you discover the magic of storytelling in all its forms. Very special guest with a very special story. Please welcome Act 
lecturer and author Soha Ali Khan. The story that I've chosen is called Someday. Here it is. And it's by Alison McGee and Peter H. Reynolds. It's a story that I've read many times to Inaya. Everyone, grab a pencil, eraser and a notebook as we are about to learn how to write short stories. That's very simple. All you have to remember is five points. Grumpy, we have a special story for you that dates back to the year 1962. Major Shaitan Singh Bhatti and his soldiers. Chief ne Bharat par hamla bola tha. Ye ladai pura ek mahina chali thi. Our storyteller today is Katrina Zayel, all the way from Lithuania in in um in Europe. Yes, in Europe. And she's going to tell us about some strange and fascinating mythological creatures. Today I will introduce you all to Lithuanian mythology. I will show you our modern world full of hidden myth mythical creatures. I will narrate to you an episode of from one of our oldest epics, the Ramayana. We'll be waiting to hear from you. Until next time, bye-bye!